Welcome to Global Perspectives. What do you make of the growing intensity and erratic nature of hurricanes? For answers, we talk to Philip Klotzbach, research scientist at Colorado State University. Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator, John Bercia. Welcome to the show, Phil. Thanks, John. Well, thanks for having me. Real pleasure. So why don't you start by telling us about how you got into hurricane forecasting? It's not something everyone does. Well, some would say I was born with a thermometer in my mouth. Um, I've always been kind of obsessed with the weather since I was a little kid. Uh, when I was eight years old, I got a weather station. So most kids were asking for a Sega Genesis at the time, and I was asking for a weather station. So my dad and I were up putting up the weather station on Christmas Day in uh, 1988. So um, yeah, I've always been really obsessed with the weather. Um, and so I did an undergraduate degree in geography, actually, in, in Massachusetts. And for my senior research project, I actually did seasonal hurricane predictions because I thought it's crazy that there's a guy out in Colorado State, Bill Gray, who's doing predictions of hurricane seasons, how they're going to be months in advance. It's like, there's no way you can possibly do that. And then when I saw, you know, I'll be darned, this guy actually has some skill at doing that. I got really interested in that particular area of research. Um, so I took a year off and worked for a year, and then I decided to go to grad school and went out to graduate school at Colorado State University to study with Dr. Dr. Gray, who's um, really super famous, super, was super famous in the field for hurricanes, um, has studied hurricanes for about 50 years. Let's talk about him for a few minutes. He's unfortunately no longer with us, but he had a tremendous influence on your life and, and the lives of many in his circle and millions of others through his uh, forecasts. Why would he have selected a place like the Rockies to, yeah. to do her? Everyone always says, why wasn't he at one of the coastal communities. Well, Dr. Smart, Gray, right? Dr. Gray would say uh, it's because your storm surge can't get you at 5,000 feet. Um, but no, the real reason was is that he actually was finishing off his PhD at the University of Chicago studying tropical cyclones, still Chicago, really nowhere near hurricanes. Um, and the, 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 the individual who's, whose supervisor was named Herbert Real, and Herbert Real was a real famous hurricane for researcher in the 1950s. And so Real started a department, and he asked Dr. Gray if he wanted to come out um, to join the, the, the department in the early 1960s. And after and so he and Dr. Gray were kind of some of the founding members of the department, and then the, the, there have been, we've had some other really good hurricane scientists at Colorado State in the time since. And um, when we were actually going through Dr. Gray's papers after he passed away, we actually found the original hand-signed letter from Herbert Real inviting, giving Dr. Gray the job. So he had saved this letter for over 50 years, uh, still, in, still in mint condition. So one of the many things that we preserved um, of Dr. Gray's records that we found after he passed away. Tell us how you first met Dr. Gray, and I'm thinking in particular about the story that the two of you are both baseball fans, or am I yes, forgetting yes. that? Yeah, so Dr. Gray, um, I sent my application to go to grad school, so he called up and offered me a position, so I came out to CSU. And actually, the fir I first met him at um, an AMS, an American Meteorological Society hurricane conference. And so one of the first questions that he asked me was, um, you know, who, was the, who has the record for the most uh, runs batted in in a single season? And so when I told him it was Hack Wilson in 1930 with 191 RBIs, he was very happy and said he could join the project. Um, he was an avid baseball fan. Um, grew up in Washington, so he was a big Nationals slash Senators fan. Um, and I grew up in Boston area, so I was a big Red Sox fan. So we were both were united by the fact that neither of us liked the New York Yankees. I was going to say there probably was a team you both didn't like. Exactly, yes. The Yankees it. was always, uh, was, we always could agree that if the, if the Yankees were losing, it was a good day. So you impressed him right off the bat with your ability to recite statistics, which is obviously critical to this field. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, when I started at CSU, I kind of was thinking, you know, how do these, these people, because obviously Dr. Gray and he had other students and researchers that all had quoted all these hurricane statistics. And, you know, when you use these hurricanes, when you look at the hurricanes day in and day out, you start to recognize patterns and you learn about historical seasons and kind of the signals that kind of led to active seasons in the past and inactive seasons in the past. And that's what we use as one of our primary tools for um, seasonal hurricane prediction. But I do want to mention Dr. Gray, even though he's best known kind of internationally for a seasonal hurricane forecast, he's done a tremendous amount of other research. We actually have a paper that just came out on Dr. Gray's life and legacy in the bulletin of the American Meteorological Society. And in that paper, we discuss, um, he made fundamental discoveries in terms of tropical cyclone genesis, so where, why they form, where they form, um, tropical cyclone structure, intensity change, tropical cyclone motion, um, and even just clouds in the tropics. He made some really fundamental discoveries there. So the, he was kind of a jack of all trades. He was more than just the guy who did seasonal hurricane forecasts. But he was never that attached to the technology that is used in hurricane forecasting today relative to others in the field. 
No, so, so Dr. Gray was, uh, he was, he said he was, he always said he was, a, he was, he was, um, he was a BS man. He was before satellite. Um, so yeah, he'd been around for, he had studied tropical meteorology for a long time. So he would use, he would have other people get data off of computers for him, but he never really liked to use computers himself. And um, I think it's a real testament to his, um, just kind of his fundamental ability to kind of grasp what was going on because, you know, nowadays it's really easy to make plots. You can crunch hundreds and thousands of numbers instantaneously, whereas for him, he had to make all these calculations longhand. So he had to kind of know what he was looking for even beforehand, as opposed to now when you can kind of just do these data mining searches. Um, so it was, he really had kind of a really good just fundamental grasp on how the atmosphere ocean ticked. You talk about the complexities of the subject matter, and yet one of the things he was good at, and I remember this from the first time I talked to him long, long time ago, when you were probably already thinking about meteorology but hadn't started your formal study, but um, I was asking him a question about something, and he said, you know, you're asking too many, and we need to simplify the conversation, and let's just do one, two, three, and then we can talk again later. And I think that was in the interest of getting off the phone as well, but... Um, he had a knack for taking really complicated issues and explaining them in ways that just about anyone could process. Yeah, I think that was really, um, you know, a fundamental thing about Dr. Gray was he was really able to kind of boil down really complicated things. And he had, he understood them in a complicated manner, but he also, he, he felt, and I also feel like it's very critical that you be able to explain them in a simple manner. Um, and so I think he did a really good job of kind of taking all these complicated statistics and all this complicated data analysis and just boiling it down into, say, three or four simple points, like you said, that most people can understand. I think that was really one of the great things about Dr. Gray is he was able to take, you know, a lot of people, a lot of, say, brilliant scientists have all these ideas in their head, but they have a hard time kind of simplifying it down so, you know, the, a normal person can understand them. And Dr. Gray was really good at that. And that's why I think always his talks at um, various conferences were always very popular because, it wasn't, it wasn't hard to follow, it wasn't hard to listen to. You made it fairly straightforward and, and simple to understand. Um, you are fond of saying, and others as well, that his work still informs your hurricane forecast. Explain that to uh, viewers who may not see all the connections. Yeah, so basically, so Dr. Gray, when he started doing the seasonal hurricane forecasts, the reason that he started doing them was that he noted there were certain sets of conditions that tended to precede an active season and a different set that preceded an inactive season. So for example, he noticed he knew which years were El Nino years and which years were La Nina years. And El Nino is warmer than normal water in the central and eastern tropical Pacific. When those waters are warm, warmer than normal, what that tends to do is it increases upper level westerly winds that blow off the tops of the hurricanes and really knock the storms down. Um, for example, in 2017, we didn't have La Nina, which is kind of the opposite of El Nino, but it was close. So we didn't have those strong shearing winds, and we obviously had a very, we just came through a very active season. But Dr. Gray noted these kind of relationships, um, things like El Nino, he noted that when you had El Nino, you had fewer hurricanes. Um, and so he put that relationship and a couple of other relationships and developed um, a seasonal forecast model which he started doing in 1984. Um, and so basically what he always believed in was using precursor signals. So basically, which conditions precede active seasons, which con conditions precede inactive seasons, and then use a model built off of that to forecast the future. And in general, the models worked fairly well. I mean, we started doing these in 1984. We're now um, in 2017, so we've come, we've been doing 34 years of seasonal hurricane forecasts. And the fact that people are still paying attention to them obviously indicates that they do show some skill. And so we issue several forecasts throughout the year. We put out a first forecast in early April, which then we update at the 1st of June. We update it again in early July, and we issue a final update on the th in early August. And while August is two months into the hurricane season, one of the things I want to emphasize is that typically June and July, while part of the hurricane season, are pretty quiet. We don't see a lot of landfalls. It's generally fairly quiet in the Atlantic. The Atlantic hurricane season really ramps up in August. August, September, October are the most active three months. September is the most active month. September on 2017 is a case of September on steroids. It was the most active calendar month we've ever had in the Atlantic Basin on record going back to the late 19th century. So um, again, emphasize that you know the peak of the season while peaks in September, um, the September is really when the Atlantic hurricane season peaks. But again, so we, so Dr. Gray's idea was that you have these precursor signals that then basically you use to then forecast what's likely to happen in the future. Now, you and others anticipated a more intense than normal season in 2017, and it actually exceeded, I think, everyone's expectations, mm -hmm. and even surprised folks who had been watching these things for years, including you to some extent, even though you've seen just about everything. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what was it about the 2017 season that 
was, was so hard to predict, especially some of these storms that intensified so quickly and, and stayed strong for an unusual amount of time. Yeah, I mean, basically this season, if you look at calendar months, June, July, August, October, we're all very close to normal. A little above, a little below, but really pretty much dead on normal. And then September was the most active month on record. And the last few Septembers have actually been pretty quiet. We've actually had well below normal activity in September. So the peaks of the season climatologically have been dead. And this year it was, it was incredibly active. Um, obviously we had Harvey in late August, but then we had Irma, Jose, Maria, Katya, um, we had all these storms late um, in September, and obviously, especially Irma and Maria and Harvey did huge amounts of damage. Um, like you said, the big question is what made the season so active? Um, a couple of factors. Uh, we had La Nina, we didn't officially meet the NOAA definition of La Nina, but the atmosphere was responding in a La Nina-like manner, such that the vertical wind shear, which is the change in wind direction with height in the atmosphere, was quite low. And so hurricanes like to be upright, and if you have too much winds, basically if you have winds at one level blowing one direction and winds at the other level blowing the other direction, it tends to basically tilt the hurricane circulation, and you can't get the pressure fall that you need to get the strong hurricanes. So if you look at hurricanes, like especially Irma and Maria, they were virtually perfectly symmetrical. They looked almost perfect on satellite imagery, and that's because they had very little vertical shear. Also, the waters in the Atlantic were quite warm this year and warmer water is what fuels hurricanes, so warmer water means more fuel for the developing storms. The warm water also tends to be associated with lower pressures, um, increased levels of moisture, so basically just all the conditions that you need to get strong hurricanes really were met, and really in a fairly tight time window from late August through late September. By the time we got into October, conditions weren't, as partic weren't particularly conducive, and October ended up only being a near average month. Uh, you and, and others in the business often describe hurricanes as attractive or, or not. And a lot of people, especially survivors of bad ones, think they're all horrible. But wh what, what is it that constitutes, an, uh, is it the shape of it, the way it forms that is attractive versus something that is more raggedy and... Well, I mean, obviously, you know, it's one thing looking at it from a satellite image, you know, from space where it looks pretty or attractive, but then obviously when you're on the ground, it's a whole different story. I've been through a couple of hurricanes and obviously, thankfully nothing as bad as some of the ones that we've obviously experienced in the past year, but obviously hurricanes are incredibly devastating on the ground. Um, but when you're talking about the way hurricanes look in terms of like, you know, how they are compared with the classic hurricane, um, Obviously, typically, you know, if your storms have kind of a fairly small, medium-sized eye, and like a lot of it has to do with the symmetry of the storm. If the storm is fairly symmetric, especially Hurricane Irma, was really, I characterize it as a buzzsaw as it went through the Caribbean. I mean, it just was basically perfectly symmetrical and just really maintained that kind of that, kind of that classic hurricane structure for several days, and that's not typical. Usually, you know, the storms will kind of go through internal circulation changes and things like that that will tend to weaken it on occasion. So the fact that Irma was able to maintain that intensity for so long is one of the things I think that set Hurricane Irma apart from a lot of the other storms um, that we've seen. Obviously Harvey, while a strong hurricane when it made landfall, the real issue with Harvey was the fact that the storm just stalled. So basically there was no real kind of, the mid latitudes that basically steer the storms didn't have any kind of flow to kind of push the storm along, so it just kind of basically stalled right near the Gulf of Mexico, so it was able to tap all that warm, moist Gulf air and just inundate um, the Houston metro area with 30, 40, 50, even as much as 60 inches of rain, and obviously we saw um, devastating flooding from that. But if there had been a different scenario, if the storm had maintained its strength, uh, for example, if there had been more of a storm surge um, and the precipitation as well, that would have been a, a nightmare scenario even worse than what we had. Correct. Yeah. I mean, there's obviously a lot of things that go into, I mean, if you talk about a storm like Hurricane Harvey, you know, you have Harvey where it, um, you know, it came ashore in an area that was not particularly densely populated. So if Harvey had basically just made landfall and kept going and died over Texas, like most hurricanes do, obviously it would have devastated Port Aransas, Mansfield area, but the, the population there isn't particularly large. So devastating for those people, but in terms of financial devastation to the state of Texas, fairly small. But obviously because of the rain, it caused massive amounts of financial damage. Um, whereas obviously if you had taken um, Harvey and say run it, you know, up the Houston ship channel or something, it could have potentially even been worse. Um, but that's obviously the case with a lot of these storms. In the case of Irma, while it devastated the Florida Keys, you know, some subtle changes in its track certainly spared the Florida Peninsula from while it was still a bad storm from what could have been potentially a catastrophic storm. Can you talk about a worst case scenario for Florida from Irma if it had followed 
either a Florida East Coast track or a middle of the state track? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, I mean, if you looked at what the Hurricane Center was predicting or what could have been a couple of days before Irma made landfall, what you had is you had a Category 5 hurricane just north of Cuba, and it was forecast to basically track just north of Cuba and then turn and basically go straight up the west coast of Florida, bringing incredible amounts of storm surge into southwest Florida, Fort Myers, Naples, into Tampa, St. Petersburg. And if you look at the storm surge inundation maps forecast from the Hurricane Center, the potential inundation was, was huge, 8, 10 feet in Fort Myers and Naples. But fortunately, the storm hit, for, unfortunately for Cuba, but fortunately for the United States, the storm made landfall in Cuba, which obviously devastated Cuba, but weakened the storm considerably. And then as it was coming up through the Florida Keys, it got hit by a lot of dry air kind of wrapped into the storm, and it got hit by a lot of shear. And basically what that shear did is it basically tilted the circulation and basically weakened the southern side of the storm, such that as the storm was going north across the Keys and into Naples area, um, you had all the water getting blown out of the bays. You saw all the people running around in Tampa Bay. Well, when the winds on the back side of the storm came and blew the water back in, they were much weaker, so we didn't see the massive storm surge inundation that, we had, that potentially could have been there. And also, too, the storm made landfall in Naples as opposed to staying further out into the Gulf of Mexico where it could have done potentially a lot more. It could have, would have stayed stronger and also brought potentially a lot more storm surge into Tampa Bay. So I would say, you know, if, if, if you had had Irma go, say, a little further north of Cuba and then make a right hook but not go into South Florida but stay kind of up along the west coast of Florida, that would have been a pretty close to a worst case scenario, at least for the west coast of Florida. And obviously, you know, if you run a similar storm along the east coast of Florida or in the central part of Florida, all those would have been horrible situations, especially given the massive size of Hurricane Irma. I mean, the size of its hurricane force winds, tropical storm force winds. While the super intense winds was fairly tight near the center, it had a very large swath of hurricane, especially tropical storm force winds. So you saw large power outages throughout the state that could have potentially been even worse. Well, I know you can't answer this question, but why is this happening? There are some who attribute it to climate change, and I would often ask Dr. Gray when there was a, an intense season what was going on, and, and he would say, oh, you, you're taking the short-term view. He said, I'm thinking about potentially the next ice age, which mm -hmm. was not part of my <laughs> uh, sphere of reference for anything, yeah. but, but, um, but, but somewhere in between there's, a, there's an answer or a partial answer. Is it climate change? Is it something else? Well, I think one of the things we have to notice, is, especially for the state of Florida, I mean, Florida has been really lucky. So since obviously 2004 and 2005 were devastating for the state of Florida. Um, we had Charlie, we had Francis, we had Ivan and Jean, and then we had Hurricane Wilma, especially in 2005, did a ton of damage. But then we went from 2006 to 2015, we had 10 years with not one hurricane hitting the state, which is a really good string of luck, the longest string that they had ever had. Um, but then we had um, Hermine last year, which did some damage, but again, not a huge amount. And then this year, obviously, with Irma, kind of that streak of good luck for the state of Florida ended. Um, but if you go back in history and just look at the history books, if you go back to the late 1940s, Florida was, South Florida was hit by five major hurricanes in six years. Um, and obviously in the late 40s, there wasn't a huge population in South Florida. So while it did damage, the, there wasn't the property and the values to be damaged that there is now today. Um, so I think even regardless of any climate change impacts, you have just the past that we can we worry about. Uh, with climate change, the observational database doesn't necessarily show that storms are necessarily getting that much stronger. And I think that's because, one, we don't have confidence in the data going back real far, so it's hard to see what we think are going to be fairly small increasing trends in storm intensity um, based on the historical data. But what we do know is obviously we're going to see more damage, one, just due to the fact that there's more people and stuff in harm's way, which hopefully will be ameliorated some by the strong building codes that the state of Florida has, which certainly we've seen has diminished damage, especially in the newer built homes. But also we have increased inundation from higher sea levels. So even if the storm surge is the same, because the background sea level is higher, we're going to see more storm inundation. So water levels rising with the storms. And also I think it's um, pretty well at this point that we're going to see slightly higher precipitation levels from the storm, say on the order of 5 to 10 percent. So not necessarily saying storm precipitation rates are going to double, but 5 to 10 percent can make an additional difference beyond the storm surge inundation from the higher sea levels, let alone what we think are probably going to be in the future the models are saying storms may become slightly fewer, but perhaps a little bit stronger, maybe on the order of 5 to 10 percent. So are we doing everything that is within our power? Obviously, there's a cost attached to defending yourself against hurricanes. And at the same time, we do have advance notice most of the time mm -hmm. when, when they're coming. 
Uh, the building codes obviously are part of the answer. People need to prepare more. They need to have sort of a 24-7 sense of being ready for these kinds of things, not just during hurricane season, but, but in general. Um, but beyond that, I mean, if you've got a, a, a storm that's like Harvey or Irma or, or another that's huge and strong and, and bigger than the state of Florida, what, what can you actually do except just take it? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, one of the ideas that they always say is that you basically you run from the water and you hide from the wind. And so when it comes to wind, I mean, you can build a house that can withstand pretty much any winds that hurricanes can bring. Um, and the costs associated with mitigation aren't necessarily that high. I can give you a case in point from my parents' house in Massachusetts, and they live on the water in Massachusetts, and they were just getting really strong winds from nor nor'easters, effectively, in the winter, 60, 70, 80 miles an hour, and they were getting shingles flying off the roof, and I asked my, I asked my dad what the, you know, and basically what he did is he just went in and they just redid the, basically put some, effectively just put some increased tie downs and stuff on the roof, and since then they've had all sorts of storms and no, and no roof damage, and it was like a few hundred bucks. So I mean, it was, you know, it's not like it doesn't cost anything, but that, is a lot cheaper than having to replace shingles every time you get a bad storm. And so there are some simple mitigation factors that we can do. Obviously, if you live in a storm surge zone and you have, you know, they're forecasting eight feet of water at your house and you live at four feet, I mean, you need to get out. So, I mean, I think the thing is, you know, if you live someplace where the risk of storm surge is low, then you can probably basically build your house such that you don't even necessarily need to evacuate in the case of a hurricane. But obviously, if, you, if you're in a storm surge zone and they say you need to leave, then you certainly need to leave. Um, but there's generally shelters, even in your local county, that you can be safe from pretty much any hurricane that comes through. And I'd certainly, you know, suggest some people when they are, if there is an evacuation order put out, to not necessarily flee the state to go to, you know, to go to, Mich to visit your aunt in Michigan unless you really want to go and see your aunt in Michigan. You know, you're better off just spending time just going to a local evacuation center because therefore you can get back to your place sooner. And also, too, that ameliorates issues with, you know, fuel and all those other issues that come up if you're trying to um, evacuate hundreds of miles away. We often see photos pre and post storm of damage to houses and buildings and things like that. Um, in some cases, the windows, the walls are blown out, but the roof is intact. And it seems to me that if all of that was being blown away, that the roof wouldn't be there either, unless those were caused by storm surge and that storm surge maybe didn't make it to the roof level. But what, what causes the seemingly stronger parts of the house to be blown away. Is it the storm surge? Well, I mean, it can be. It depends kind of on the situation. I mean, kind of the idea is that you want to basically tie down the entire structure and keep it as a single unit. Because usually, unless it's a surge, it tends to be more the roof that would fail. And obviously, if you lose any part of your roof, then the house is very likely gone. Because again, once the water gets in, it doesn't take much water to basically destroy that, cause the house to be effectively totaled. Um, so I think really the key is, is basically kind of tying down everything together. But obviously if you have surge, you know, if your wind's coming from up top and the surge coming from down below, um, it can be kind of a double whammy and it could potentially, you could have the water. Um, Cause again, it doesn't take that much water. So even if it doesn't necessarily take out the whole house, if you get a foot of water in the house, that can really be the death knell for your house. It doesn't necessarily mean that your ha entire house has to be covered in water for it to be destroyed. Cause once the mold and mildew gets in, it's really, really hard to ameliorate, especially in a humid climate, such as what you have in Florida most of the time. I know there's probably a dozen answers to this question, but if you had to pick one recommendation that you would make, especially in light of the 2017 hurricane season, as far as preparing people, defending the communities better against hurricanes, what, what would that be? Well, I mean, I think the thing is, is that, you know, I mean, in general, you know, every hurricane, I mean, there's, you need to be prepared the same every hurricane season because while I do seasonal hurricane forecasts, and obviously I find them interesting because they do them, they can't, we can't tell you where the storms are going to go. So whether we predict an active season or an inactive season, um, you just have to be prepared the same every year because it just takes that one storm to make it an active season for you. And that doesn't mean June 1st you, you freak out and you, know, you can't go about your life till the end of November. I mean, most hurricane seasons, thankfully, you know, wherever you happen to live, probably not going to be severely impacted by a hurricane. But you know, it just takes that one storm to make it an active season for you. So, you know, now that the hurricane season is done, you know, now's the time to really basically, you know, to kind of review your preparedness, basically know what you're going to do if a storm does threaten. And really my advice is whenever there's a storm that does threaten to follow the advice of your local emergency management. Don't go on Twitter and see what, you know, what some so-called expert is saying or whatever. The key is to go to follow your local emergency management because they are in close contact with the hurricane center, the local weather service offices, and they know best in terms of whether you should evacuate, shelter in place, and just follow their advice throughout the course of the storm. What would help you in making more accurate predictions? 
Well, so I do seasonal hurricane forecasts. So what would help me is going to be different than say what would help the Hurricane Center in terms of doing the next day-to-day -day weather forecast. But I will say that the Hurricane Center's forecasts, and especially their track forecasts, so where the storm is likely to move, has gotten much better. Every year it gets better and better and better, and that's just because a lot of it is the models that they use to forecast are constantly improving. And obviously the Hurricane Center forecasters are the best in the business, so they take the model output and improve those forecasts. Uh, for me, what I love is any sort of historical data sets that I can get my hands on really help me out because basically I build my forecasts off of historical data. So longer, data, longer periods of data that I can get that have reliable data, have reliable conditions of say, surface pressures, water temperatures, winds, things like that really help me out along with improved hurricane data because I want to have kind of what the atmosphere ocean conditions are and then how many hurricanes there were and how strong those hurricanes were to be able to make the most accurate forecasts that I can. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Phil Klotzbach. Thank you. And thank you for Global Perspectives. I'm John Bercia, and we'll see you next time.